Uh, morning, everyone. Um, this, uh, I'm Piers O'Hanlon. This is uh, Ravi Shankar um, Borgana, and um, we've uh, been working on uh, something we've dubbed the uh, the Wi-Fi based MC catcher. And uh, so we're going to take you through just a, a quick overview of uh, what we're going to cover um, in the presentation. So, firstly, just um, for those of you who aren't aware, like what is an MC? Um, and uh, then we're going to talk about conventional MC catchers. MC is basically just the identifier that's inside, that identifies a subscriber, the international mobile subscriber identifier. Um, and there are conventional devices that have been around for a while, ones with sort of um, trade names like uh, Stingray, um, that sort of work in the, uh, the mobile spectrum. Um, but our approach uh, operates in uh, Wi-Fi and um, it basically exploits um, two issues, um, two sort of functionalities within um, the, the way that mobiles, um, basically smartphones, but can be other devices, um, connect to, um, automatically connect to Wi-Fi networks based on their um, MC, um, and also um, another technique that's based around when um, devices connect um, to the sort of operator services for Wi-Fi calling. So then, and then we're going to talk about uh, mitigations for the operator vendor OS, uh, user mitigations, and then a demo. So what is an MC? It's basically, as I said, um, international mobile subscriber identity. It's a, typically a 15-digit number. Um, the first couple of digits uh, indicate the, uh, the country code, and then the next couple well, the first three actually, um, country code. Next two or three sometimes, depending on where you are, indicate the mobile um, network provider, in, in which case, this one's just a kind of made up one. Um, 234 is actually the, uh, the UK code. Um, and uh, 12 is um, some kind of rail track one, but it just happened to be 1234. So I just um, put it in there, because what I've done in the demo, I've, uh, I've used that same MC as the kind of demo MC, because I don't want to be splashing real ones around. Um, then it basically allows for the authentication of a device to the network. It's the identifier, it's like your username in a way. Um, and then that keys, that then allows the, um, the, the phone and the operator's um, databases to then um, index your secret key, which, is, um, which they both have a copy of, and then do this um, network authentication um, procedure. And it's typically um, stored within, um, in, in two places, basically, inside the SIM card in the phone. And um, the MC can actually be read off of the, uh, off of the actual SIM card using like a SIM reader, one of these little cheapo sort of things, or you can spend a lot of money. But uh, basically, it's pretty straightforward to read an MC off of a SIM if you actually got it in your hands. But uh, it's generally another story if as you sound a device and you want to try and find out what's the MC of like that sort of this mobile phone here like sitting on the desk. Um, uh, but this is what we've, um, the t technique we've developed to do that. Um, then also inside the, the SIM card there's, there's, um, there's the secret key which is kept secret. You can't access that. You can't just sort of say, um, plug it into that reader and say, give me the secret key, it, it, um, it's, it doesn't happen. It's kind of protected. You can basically just provide, you can send it a random number and it'll then um, carry out some algorithms to uh, do the um, authentication challenge. But then it's also stored in the operator, um, so they clearly need to have it to uh, verify um, that it's, uh, that it's a, a legit um, subscriber. So it's also an identifier that um, can be used for tracking. So um, it's a fairly unique identifier that uh, basically is tied to the subscriber, tied to the SIM, and typically people don't change their SIM very often. So um, it gives you a good idea of um, who it is. But there are also a bunch of other identifiers associated with most smartphones these days, like um, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, NFC addresses like the MAC address. All those you may be aware, um, there have been moves to um, make the Wi-Fi MAC address a bit more elusive. Um, iOS introduced um, MAC randomization um, on uh, Wi-Fi probing. Um, uh, I think in uh, 
iOS 8, um, and uh, then they've taken it slightly further forward. Um, Windows Mobile introduced it, and uh, Android is, is bringing it in as well. Um, and then there's other device identifiers that are more associated just purely with the mobile phone, the IMEI, the International Mobile Equipment Identifier, which is actually just tied to the actual hardware of the device. It never changes. In fact, it's kind of illegal to go uh, changing those, that, that, um, that identifier. But that can also be tracked with some of the um, sort of uh, conventional MC catchers, do a downgrade attack, and then you go into a 2G attack, and then you can extract the, uh, the IMEI. And then there's um, what's sort of technically known as the MSISDN, which is actually just uh, like your phone number. Um, that potentially can also be used for, uh, for tracking, but that's typically not that easy to get hold of. Um, although um, there are sort of subscription services out there that um, allow you to look up an MC and then find out what the potentially find out what the corresponding numbers are. Some of these are probably in a bit of a gray gray area. So now I'm going to hand over to uh, Ravi, who's been working in, in the conventional MC catcher world for um, a little while. He's going to give you an overview of that. Yeah, so if you mean some of you guys were last year in Black Hat, uh, that was in Amsterdam, so we had a talk on LT MC catchers. We explained some 4G MC catchers, how to build and all those. Uh, but now I'm not going too detailed, just to give introduction briefly about uh, what with the conventional MC catcher, what they basically use. Now the title says Wi-Fi based MC catcher, so you may have a question in your mind whether you just track the guy or whether you're also intercepting his data communication or maybe, or call, for example, right? So. Uh, basically, all these MC catcher has a two purpose what they use. Uh, the first is purely about the tracking. So first they wanted to ta uh, track the users. So this could be either targeted attacks or may maybe just, just listening all the surrounding users and try to infer from the identity who belongs to whom. So there are multiple ways of, you, you could say targeted, targeted attacks or maybe just a random attack. Uh, the second is interception about, okay, now once you track the guy, you know his identity. You fix your target now, so what you could do from there. Now, you can ask him to attach to your MC catcher, like a Stingray device, and then you try to intercept his call or SMS. Now, of course, you need a backend support to, to let him feel that this is the right base station you are talking, and, and he doesn't feel any interruption between the call. If he feels something, of course, he gets alert that something is bad, which is happening weird. So there has to be a... Uh, efficient connection to the backend telco provider by any means, so I'm not covering those means, but there has to be a enough connection, uh, there has to be a technical uh, uh, capability to connect to this MC catcher back to the telecom network so that if the normal guy is making a landline call, he should be able to make a landline call or mobile call, for example, right? So the second part is about interception, so same goes apply with the SMS and as well as data connection. Now, with the data connection, there is a possibility, I will, co I will come to the next slide with, with, uh, with the 2G and 3G differences. And uh, these MC catchers, of course, operates on the licensed mobile brands, uh, of frequency bands, uh, and uh, this could be GSM, 3G, and 4G. In the market right now, we have seen already GSM and 3G. There are some, actually, if you Google, by say, uh, if you Google, you will also find there are some MC catcher product, which also says that they operate on a 4G brand. Uh, 4G frequency bands, but the problem is, uh, okay, most of them claim they, they try to do downgrading. So basically they just jam the frequency which is operate for 4G or 3G and they ask it to come back to 2G. So as you may aware that 2G already has a lot of, lots of problems, there is no mutual authentication and easily you can be snoop using 2G calls and it's, it's way easier than 3G and 4G. So all the bands are available, but it's just a, it's a matter of whether somebody is downgrading you or not downgrading you. Uh, and by definition, of course, what this Stingray device or MC catcher means, somebody just brings some kind of a device, which is act like a base station. And nowadays, the base station size is not like a big, which you see in the building. So basically, the smallest size in the market, or you may guys have some actually, if you live in UK right now, you can also buy this small, uh, like a DSL modem boxes, which is like a base station, basically. And you can also, like small device, you can buy that, buy that device and, and convert into MC catcher. So size is getting really long. What it does basically just try to connect all surrounding mobile phones, which has a limited range, like a 50 meter until, depending on the RF capability of your device, and then you can ask the devices to connect you. Uh, and they operate in a two mode, uh, which I somehow explained initially. So first is passive mode. Passive means you are just acting as a bad guy, listening on the RF, doing nothing. So you're just looking at the broadcast packets, 
what you can see any identity or any any uh, parameters if unfortunately if the, there is no encryption there you may see some extra information like calls and sms but depending on if there is encryption or not so the passive guy can't really do anything but definitely he can try to infer the mc because again now uh, we are not going detail because next uh, Pierre will in, uh, talk about the wi-fi but in mobile networks basically what happens if you're getting a call like incoming call or data connection what happens the base station sends you the high message which, con which contains your identity so it could be the mc which Pierre already explained or it could be a tmc or like uh, another term which we use in 4g called guti so that may try to infer you this is you guy and this is what the passive uh, MC, passive mc catcher does it just monitors everything on the rf side and try to infer your identity so there are different techniques uh, which we explained last year uh, in the active style then somebody just try to bring the base station which try to mimic as your operator for example you are using a vodafone sim card and the attacker will set up this base station as a vodafone so your phone automatically sees there is a vodafone base station which has a max which has a nice signal strength and our, our phone is designed such a way that as long as he sees a maximum power strength from the near base station it will just try to connect to there connect to there instead of the uh, the base station which has a lesser power so somebody can exploit that vulnerability so somebody just bring base station near to you so it will just automatically disconnect from the base station which is on the building and it will connect to the attackers which is nearby so this is like tmc catcher and this can be used for intercepting your calls as well because this is this has some capability to support the call functionality or or internet functionality and also to intercept your sms because you need to give the feel that the sms is being really delivered of course one you, you could have in mind like okay i can bring an active base station and i will just intercept every calls and i will not deliver to the network but that's fine but the user may get alert that okay i'm sending a, i'm making a call everything I'm, uh, it's being ringing but actually nobody's picking the call so he may feel something weird so it's about uh, without detection so what is the cost on those boxes basically so uh, commercial solutions are quite expensive if you wanted to buy like a special mc catcher but now again this statement is kind of a bad if i say like this now if you just go google alibaba if you can just go on alibaba or find any other commercial tools russian and chinese you may find that somebody's trying to sell for three thousand dollars or maybe until fifty thousand dollars and you can just buy these boxes originally these box boxes are only allowed to buy or sell for the government agencies but now you may be you make you can also buy those ones or you can build yourself with just a laptop and there are a lot lots of software defined video platforms where you can install open source software like osmocom open bts uh, even the 3g version we have uh, uh, open bts umts plus the 4g srs open lte you can install so you have a different variant which are used for the research platforms but they can be also convert into mc catchers and this technology of, of uh, mc catchers has been long time since 1990 and it has, this has been patented first time patented by uh, a german company rode and schwarz which was back in 1993 so there are also already other patents about this mc catcher which the way you track other people around that so you can also look for, for the information so before we head to the main talk so just to give a difference between this 2g and 3g and what we could do actually there and uh, and what is the flaw because now when we talk about this next wi-fi mc catcher you will also see there are some kind of a same similar kind of a flaw we exploit basically this is about the design the way our mobile communication work or authentication in the sim card or the way users subscriber actually authenticated on the 2g we know that they exploit the protocol flaws where there is no mutual authentication between the base station and uh, mobile phone so this is like a existing flaw this can't be fixed for 2g communication unfortunately so it allows for tracking and interception somebody can just bring fake base station say hey i'm this guy and let's talk mobile phone can't do anything and uh, the, the the saddest part in our side is that mobile phone is always act as a dumb device in a protocol communication so whatever the base station tells do this it just accepts let's do this so this has been fixed in 3g and 4g if the fake base station comes and hey talk to me in a plain text it will say no i'm not going to talk to plain text at least have integrity protection messages at least it will use a key integrity key to talk to each other of course they can disable encryption but there is a integrity key whether you can't read it but this is only available in 3g and 4g but not in 2g so 2g is completely uh, problematic if somebody brings a fake base station and the size is on the c on the on the picture with this one with the 3g and 4g uh, uh, so again they exploit the same architecture issues like somebody can bring a fake base station can get the identity but they can't really have a key to talk to each other after the authentication so still fine but somebody can easily track 
and difficult to intercept. And that's what the claim, because you see in media article, okay, somebody built a 4 GMC capture and they're trying to intercept. No, this is not possible because you're not gonna get the key which is used to talk to the communication. This key is only belong to the operator and, and uh, until and unless you have all the key material, you can't really decrypt anybody's calls or communication even very, when you are using a 4G MC catcher. Uh, and uh, commercial, all the products MC catcher, they try to downgrade you or uh, use of legitimate base station, which is also possible. Like in 2012 Black Hat, we had to talk about using a femtocell, which is like I said, small base station of 4G, you can buy this. This is like a small embedded Linux box, which you can uh, compromise this box. You can, act, you can just uh, root on the box. You can try to circumvent IPv6. I, sorry, IPsec uh, communication, extract the key, and basically you see everything in plain text. And that's possible if you bring this kind of solutions for 4G interception, act as MC catcher, that's possible. On the picture you see, this is like a small base station which is used for the emergency purpose. So what this base station has, this has a backend satellite connection. And if somebody brings this kind of solutions as a 4G MC catcher in the backpack, of course, then actually he can intercept every 4G call. That's complete, this is called a legitimate base station which has a backend support of some operator. And now you may question some shady operators may have some connection to do that. But now, okay, what is the protection on these MC catchers and why we have to look in the Wi-Fi, right? So there is no protection available for the phone which you're carrying in your uh, pocket now. Like you have, if you have an iPhone, you have an Android phone, you have a Windows phone, you have a Blackberry, there is no such app can work effectively to detect this kind of attacks. Like somebody's really tracking you or not tracking you. Uh, okay, there are some special tools. There are some apps available. But the special phones can only act as an, uh, I would say, some limited options you have there. So those, those are the phones which support encrypted calls as well. They can, they can act, they can have a special tools as a firewall for the baseband, which can try to prevent those threats. They can try to detect the silent SMS and all those uh, nasty attacks. Uh, but those are expensive. The cost is really go until, I'm, I don't know exact, exact price, but the last time uh, I remember from the price from the guy's dimension of about 3,500 US dollars, something around that. And there are some apps which we also develop at Sales. Like we, I have a talk in, I had a talk in Black at 2014 about the app called Darshak. We, we developed that app to detect MC catchers, but they, this was only works on Samsung phones, Samsung Galaxy S3, which has an Intel baseband. And the later uh, uh, SR Labs in Germany, they also introduced an app called Snoop Snitch. So you can install those apps and try to detect the MC catchers, right? So this also works, but you need to root the phone, and not every normal user could do that. But now again, it comes to the back, so what is the protection? You can turn off your uh, flight mode, you can go in a flight mode and you can just use a Wi-Fi for your, all the communication and you are still secure, right? And now this used to be a common threat or this is the best protection somebody could suggest. So use like a Wi-Fi or use multi-hotspot technology, like bring another phone and take this phone as a hotspot, Wi-Fi hotspot, and then connect your phone to this middle phone. Then basically if somebody attacks, they can try to attack this phone which doesn't belong to your identity and then you can use this your phone attached as a Wi-Fi. So basically you had an intermediate layer which to talk to, to talk there. Or you can just use a Wi-Fi. But now Wi-Fi has a different things and that's what we talk in this, uh, that's what we try to introduce in this talk due to the convergence of all telecommunication technologies and everybody just want to use now Wi-Fi calling or Wi-Fi features. And why this is just a technical term about just before I hand over to peers. Because mobile operators are running out of the so they try to introduce new, technolo new technologies because you don't get the coverage inside the house or, or inside the office buildings, right? And at that time, you can't use the normal mobile connection or signal is so poor, you can't do. Either you introduce this small base station or now they are supporting to use Wi-Fi to, to use your normal mobile functions. So you will be using Wi-Fi, but basically you will use all your uh, billing plan, what you have on a SIM card. And that's, bring, that's introduced some new threats which now Pierre will try to uh, introduce you with the Wi-Fi MC catcher. Okay, thanks, Ravi. Um, yeah, so basically uh, talking about the um, Wi-Fi-based MC catcher, um, as uh, Ravi mentioned, some of the uh, conventional um, MC, MC catchers provide for um, additional services um, like interception, um, but they uh, R1 provides for basically uh, picking up um, detecting the MC and, and essentially uh, working out the location, potentially working out the location from that. I mean, typically, if you're gonna catch the MC, whether it's a conventional one um, or, or R1, you typically need to be co-located with, um, with the target, uh, and so you kind of know roughly where they are, but, um, so this, our system allows you to, to basically extract the MC, but not actually intercept the calls. Um, 
and it operates in uh, the ISM bands, the industrial scientific medical bands, which are, um, in which Wi-Fi operates typically in 2.4 gigahertz or 5, 5 gigahertz. Um, there's others as well. Um, so the range is Wi-Fi range, although of course that can be extended. You see these kind of things people will stick in Pringles packets and, uh, and all that kind of stuff to extend the range. I mean, it can be, can be done with more sophisticated approaches so you can get quite a bit more range out of Wi-Fi. Basically, um, it operates uh, by, well, I'm going to go into the detail, but one, one approach is a sort of fake access point, um, and then uh, other, the other technique is about um, either sort of spoofing, redirecting traffic to um, a operator data gateway. And we're exploiting um, weaknesses in the protocol and configuration um, to uh, achieve this. So basically, as I said, we've um, the MC catcher is based upon two techniques: um, the uh, Wi-Fi network authentication, um, which is um, one portion, and it's it's defined in this 3GPP, the uh, mobile standards body, basically in uh, standard TS33.234. Um, if you need to know the details, um, and these, this is how they refer to it in, in the spec. They call it um, WLAN direct IP access, and, um, and then Wi-Fi calling authentication is referred to as WLAN 3GPP IP access. And we've discovered issues in, um, in these two technologies. Um, um, and the cost is, is of course, um, pretty low, and um, basically virtually any Wi-Fi capable sort of computer. So anything from a laptop kind of downwards, Raspberry Pi, the old Raspberry Pi 3 has a little inbuilt Wi-Fi these days, um, which is quite handy. Um, so, just looking briefly at um, the Wi-Fi network attachment, sort of when, you, when, when a device, when a phone sort of tries to connect to the network, um, what kind of networks are there out there? Well, there's the sort of unencrypted Wi-Fi access points, um, uh, no password, basically, but then they often have something called a captive portal, which is the sort of little sheet that pops up when you try and connect to them, and um, they'll ask you for some uh, credentials, potentially, or just type in your email address or whatever it is. Um, and that's typically based on um, something called Whisper, this protocol, um, although it can be based on a bunch of weird hacks as well. It's, it's a bit of a messy area. Um, of course, they can just be completely open as well. Um, Google, interestingly enough, um, Google's um, Fi service um, relies upon um, open um, Wi-Fi access points, it says, and um, it then it sets up a, um, a little um, VPN, which they use, um, but it's not really available here, so we've had a brief dig into it, but we haven't really um, found anything particularly interesting so far. Um, Normal encrypted Wi-Fi access points, well, they're sort of pre-shared password credentials which are used to then get you connected. And then there's these auto-connect um, Wi-Fi access points. Um, I mean, there are some in sort of, um, uh, like, companies run them and things, but then there, there is, um, there, are, there are different types of way the automatic um, Wi-Fi access points um, work, but specifically we're looking at um, these access points that are um, essentially managed, well, not they're basically managed by the um, mobile operators, and they allow a mobile phone um, to negotiate, to basically um, connect to the Wi-Fi network um, automatically without any user intervention. And, and it does this by using the credentials in the, in the SIM card, basically the MC and the key. And um, this is controlled by operator provider configuration that uh, gets loaded onto the phone. Um, so it can either be um, users have to configure it manually, um, or there is there is some automatic type of configuration. So let's have a little closer look at those automatic configurations because those basically mean that um, you just um, your phone, um, kind of without you um, particularly um, asking for it, will just your operator has configured the phones to um, automatically connect to certain Wi-Fi networks. So um, a, number, a lot of the big um, big brands have 
their sort of auto Wi-Fi networks, you'll see they'll, they'll often sort of say auto AT&T or auto EE or, um, and then there are sort of more obscure ones, O2s and Wi-Fi Extra and Vodafone Wi-Fi. There's, there's a bunch of them. Um, I mean, and they're, and they're, they're quite handy because basically they, they allow the phone just connects to Wi-Fi and just uh, you get sort of full back to Wi-Fi so you get faster data connection depending on where you are. But uh, this, it works, um, it actually, automatic configuration is, is, um, is uh, set up on, on actually a number of um, Android and Windows phones. Because um, if you look at some of the web pages for um, some of these operator offerings, they say that certain brands of phones, and it includes Windows, Android, and iOS. We've had um, a bit of a closer look at iOS. iOS um, also configures the phones um, based upon the inserted SIM and act activates um, an operator-specific .mobile config file, and um, then that then configures the device, depending on what SIM's in there, um, to uh, have a bunch of pre-configured um, auto Wi-Fi um, lists in there. And um, we did a brief analysis of iOS 9, um, and uh, found more than 50 profiles, um, nearly 60 odd profiles containing auto um, Wi-Fi uh, type networks. Um, there's also a bunch of other configuration in there. Manual ones, um, so some, an some Android devices require manual config, so um, you, you basically have to follow the instructions on, on an operator website, and it's just pretty simple sort of stuff. Um, you just tap on the network and then select in the drop down, like sort of um, SIM, it said, as the, uh, the authentication technique. And then once you've done that once, then um, it then connects to, those, to that network um, repeatedly. And then Android also provides some additional carrier control mechanisms. Um, in the sort of newer versions of Android, there's, um, there are various uh, um, sort of APIs basically coming out that allow for um, configuring of the phone based upon uh, carrier profiles. So this automatic Wi-Fi authentication, um, Having a closer look at that, that is um, sort of yet another standards body, the uh, IEEE and uh, 802.1x, um, um, which is um, port-based network access control, which basically defines um, the use of a protocol called um, Extensible Authentication Protocol, or EEP, um, for, uh, for short, um, which is defined by the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, um, and that basically specifies um, transporting of this EEP um, protocol over over the LAN, over over, over Wi-Fi, um, or, or over um, like Ethernet or whatever. Um, so it's called EEP hole, um, EEP over LAN. Um, anyway, so there's, there's rather a lot of those uh, sort of standards kind of being um, put together. And in our case, looking specifically at what's happening um, when the phone tries to connect to the, um, one of these auto Wi-Fi networks, it's based upon two particular EAP methods. One, um, the first one, EAP SIM, um, which is, uh, um, it's specified in, in, um, in an internet uh, engineering task force standard and um, it is based upon sort of GSM security model with some enhancements. So there, um, so it's actually slightly better than just uh, the the basic um, GSM um, approach. But it, um, it it does have some issues. Um, but it is currently um, the most widely used at the moment for uh, phones to connect um, to the to the uh, to the Wi-Fi networks. There is also something called EAP ACA, um, which ba it's based upon 3G um, security, and um, and that is um, starting to be deployed. That provides a um, stronger um, connection, but um, unfortunately, both of these um, have the issue that um, we've discovered, which we'll talk about um, shortly. The support for these protocols is um, is actually. Um, 
implemented in Android, iOS, Windows Mobile, BlackBerry, so basically most of the world's smartphones. And um, we, uh, we've been the good guys. We, uh, we spoke to um, Apple and Microsoft and uh, BlackBerry, um, and they all um, they kind of got around to um, replying and acknowledged that it was an issue. And uh, I mean, a Apple have been um, probably uh, carrying the flag on it a bit. They, they did um, um, take things forward, and uh, they actually deployed, um, developed a new feature to go into iOS 10 as a result of, um, of our um, discussions with them, um, something called conservative peer, which I can explain in a moment, um, which is basically due to the, um, to the interactions we've had with them. So we've been talking to them for like over six months um, about this issue. Um, and uh, we've also talked to the, uh, to the GSMA, the uh, GSM Association, which is basically represents um, kind of most of the world's operators. Um, gave a talk to them about the issue a couple of months back and uh, just sort of raise awareness there. Um, but um, maybe because it's such a big issue, um, no, no one really thinks, oh, well, it's my fault, so maybe we'll, uh, maybe we'll do a privacy bounty or something like that. No one, uh, <laughs> no one kind of quite feels it's, uh, they, can, they can stop it. So there's no, there's no kind of bounties involved in this work. Um, uh, but um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's something that um, we're looking to try to get fixed. Um, but it is, it's a feature that's useful for most people. So um, it is being deployed in many countries, and the adoption is growing. So it'd be good to um, sort it out. So basically, it comes down to the EAP SIM and EAP ACA, these two protocols I mentioned, the identities that are exchanged in these protocols. Um, and there are three basic um, types uh, of identity used in the authentication phase. and. Um, well, uh, the one of um, particular interest is what's called the permanent identity, and um, which is, in this case, is the uh, is the MC. And typically, the permanent identity is exchanged, at the kind of um, initially, basically, when, when the phone first attaches to the network and tries to um, connect to the Wi-Fi, and um, after that, then then there's going to be these temporary IDs, which are the next two. Um, there's what's called a pseudonym identity, which is basically a kind of, um, it's, well, it's a pseudonym for the, uh, for the MC. So it's not the MC, but it kind of, it's like it. And it has a, it has a sort of um, a lifetime. So then you can, you, your phone then will um, send over the pseudonym. So then if someone sees that sort of flying over the wire, then they're not necessarily going to say that, ah, oh, that's, that's that guy's MC. Um, but then the protocol needs to exchange these pseudonyms and, and renew them, um, and so on. So there are some issues around using pseudonyms. Um, then there's another one called the fast reauthentication identity, which is um, a sort of lower overhead um, identifier. Basically, um, because the first interaction when you're using the, um, the MC, to actually do the proper check on it, um, your phone sort of hands over its MC, and then that gets handed into the network. And then the network then ultimately has to go to the kind of back end system and sort of say, like, where is this guy's MC, and where's the key, and let's do the proper cryptographic exchange. Um, and so that's done on initial connection. But then you then get this fast reauthentication ID, which is then um, can then be used. So it can just be used in the um, sort of the more of the edge system, so they can then just um, cache that fast reauthentication ID and then do a quick reauthentication when you kind of come back. So, like for example, on the London Underground, it'll, you'll pop between stations and you'll have to reauthenticate every time. So, it uh, speeds stuff up like that. And walking down the street, there'll be multiple access points. Um, you don't want to have to be talking to the uh, just kind of um, deep um, end of the uh, operator back systems. So. Uh, those are the three, um, and then the actual behavior is, is affected by um, what's called the peer policy. So there's um, the sort of um, current default is called liberal peer, um, which basically um, in this protocol, you can sort of say, give me your best um, identifier, and typically your best one. If you've got a fast reauthentication one, you'll send that one. Um, and um, and 
but you can also say, give me your permanent identifier. And, uh, and with liberal peer, phone just says, sure, here's my, here's my MC. So, um, and it'll just hand it over. But with conservative peer, um, which is a sort of future deployment option, um, and uh, it's it's part of the it's in the spec, but it's not generally been implemented. Um, but it has now been implemented in, in um, iOS 10. Um, although it may, I mean, it may be in 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 Android in some of the newer versions. But I'm I've been in touch with Google, but they haven't specifically mentioned it. Um, Conservative peer only responds to requests for permanent identity, as in your MC, when there's no pseudonym identity available. So it basically makes it a bit um, a bit harder to uh, extract the uh, the MC from from the device. So how is this actual conversation that we've been discussing? Um, how does this IMS, how does this EAP SIM? Um, work, like what happens to the packets. Um, and typically, EAP is a, is a general, there are lots of um, EAP sort of methods, and uh, it's an authentication protocol. It exchanges sort of um, kind of basically um, some kind of credentials. And it's not uh, encrypted. It's not encrypted sort of um, interchange. Um, and um, currently, uh, EAP SIM, EAP ACA, uh, when it's run um, EPOL, sort of uh, EAP over, over LAN, um, this 802.1x, the way that it's deployed at the moment is, um, unfortunately, it's unencrypted. So thus the MC is um, visible to a passive attacker when a permanent identity, the MC is used for um, full authentication. So on, on initial connection, and then, um, it's also, uh, it can be revealed if, um, if there's an active attack, basically, by um, requesting full authentication, um, which are the two um, sort of uglies um, on this one. So it means that uh, they can, that can be obtained, and um, we have, uh, it's, it's um, we've tested this out. Um, but, uh, I mean, you'll be happy to hear that uh, as we mentioned earlier, the actual content is is still protected. So, um, although one can get the MC, you can't actually, and you can observe the um, the whole interaction, this authentication interaction. Um, but like with a few, um, well, most um, cryptography, you can look at the sort of cryptographic interchange, and you can't actually work out um, what's being what's being said necessarily. Um, and the key, the key exchange process is designed so that the keys aren't actually transported in the clear. They're, they're, um, they're negotiated at each endpoint and, um, and retained there. So um, content is still protected. Now there are um, systems, uh, basically protocols, that can allow for um, protection, um, basically encryption of the, uh, the interchange. Um, like, for example, EAP TTLS, um, or TTLS V0, as it's typically, um, as it's currently sort of defined, and EAP TLS. Um, they um, are potential ways of, of protecting it. But they do then require support in the mobile OS and the operator and all the vendor systems so that it can be deployed. So that's, that's, that's the first um, approach uh, sort of covered, and um, I'll give a, give a demo on that. Um, so basically the MC can be revealed um, in this, in this um, interaction when a mobile phone tries to um, connect to a Wi-Fi network that has this, um, which is configured to use this EAP SIM or EAP ACA in the current, um, current configuration. Um, so, moving on to the next one, the Wi-Fi calling connection. Um, so, what happens here? When a, a phone is um, using Wi-Fi to make a call, um, this, is, this is the Wi-Fi calling stuff that's actually built into the OS, typically. So, um, iOS has sort of had it for a while, and um, I believe uh, Android has had it for a while, and, and I think Windows have um, um, I've had it, too. Um, 
but it's sort of starting to um, rise in, in terms of deployment and usage because it, um, as Ravi mentioned, I mean, there's, it, it provides sort of offload um, and in black spots and stuff like that, you can, you can use Wi-Fi. Um, it, this is different from uh, all, all the sort of over-the-top apps like um, whatever, WhatsApp, Signal, um, all the rest of them. Um, this is actually um, working with the operator. So what happens is the phone attempts to attach to, well, attempts to connect to something called the Edge Packet Data Gateway over Wi-Fi. And it can make um, voice calls over this connection. Um, and the phone will attempt to connect to the, um, to the Edge Packet Data Gateway um, when it's in areas of low signal, or it will also connect um, when it goes into airplane mode and then you flip on the Wi-Fi, interestingly enough. Um, and that's what I'm going to show in the demo. Um, so the connection to the um, EPDG uh, uses something called IPSEC, um, this IP security protocol, which um, uh, people are probably aware of. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's an exchange at the, um, at the beginning of, um, of most uh, IPSEC uh, connections, um, which is called to, to do the authentication and, and key setup. Um, um, and the particular protocol used there is called the um, is called Ike Internet Key Exchange Protocol version two right now. Um, version one was a few years back, had some problems, so they had to um, cook up a new one. So, um, and this is, as I said, supported iOS, Android, and Windows, um, and Wi-Fi calling available in a bunch of countries. And um, again, we've we've mentioned this one to the. Um, to the uh, OS guys and to the operators, and um, they're sort of aware of the situation. But it is a bit of a systemic kind of thing. Um, it requires um, a bit of work. So anyway, um, let's go into the details here. IPSEC brief overview. Um, we, uh, it's, it basically provides for authentication confidentiality um, with these um, to AH and ESP for doing, um, is actually encrypting the payloads, encrypting the voice. Key management is then done by this something called um, Ike V2. And you've got two modes. You've got what's called a tunnel mode, which is used um, for connection to the gateway. So like any, any packets from, um, well, potentially different entities on a network can be sent through a tunnel. You know, transport mode, which is just direct and um, point to point. So what happens in this internet key exchange? Um, well, there are two phases. There's something called the uh, Ike SA init, which um, negotiates some um, cryptographic algorithms and um, exchanges a bunch of stuff like nonces and everything and does something called the Diffie-Hellman exchange, um, which um, basically sets up a key pair to encrypt um, the, uh, the following exchange, the Ike auth, um, exchange, um, at which point identities are exchanged, um, um, in, in our case, in using, um, using EAP, EAP ACA in this case. Um, and uh, so the MC is being, um, is being transported. Now, it is, it is encrypted here, but unfortunately, um, this, this um, initial exchange is not actually protected by a certificate right now. So um, you can set up a man in the middle um, and basically uh, pretend to be an EPDG and the phone will connect to it and, um, and then it'll basically say, here's my MC. So um, another, uh, all right, yeah. Um, and um, so, sorry. Um, basically, that is the second issue. Um, so the MC is then revealed um, in this situation as well. So it's basically two two separate techniques um, to uh, extract the MC from from smartphones. Um, the uh, the actual call content again is, is still protected, so um, it's uh, it's just an identity attack. So, what kind of um, mitigations are there? Well, 
Um, I think one one of the things that I think is is um, it would be good to sort out would move uh, move off of EAP SIM as default and move towards ACA because EAP SIM is weaker because it uses some of the GSM um, cryptographic um, uh, technology, which isn't quite as strong as the EAP um, ACA approach. But that, there aren't any widely known sort of attacks on it. Um, the other thing is to deploy this conservative peer mode of operation um, using, well, potentially with um, EAP SIM even, but uh, preferably with EAP ACA. And then looking um, at uh, a certificate-based uh, approach, um, which uh, you would then require investing in um, putting certificates into the AAA infrastructure and um, and then it would then provide for protected um, tunnels for the EAP ACA for WaveLAN access and for um, and for the um, Wi-Fi calling. So basically, using this protocol I talked about, EAP SIM, EAP TTLS plus um, EAP ACA. Then there are other uh, looking at other potential solutions like encrypting EMC, and then there are other sort of standards that have been mentioned as possible um, ways of protecting the EMC. So it really needs the sort of standards bodies to take, a, take another look at this. Because um, there, there, there are kind of solutions in there, but they're just not really being deployed, and they're more expensive to deploy, I guess, um, but then it depends on how much you um, feel that should be protected. Um, so mobile OS mitigations, well, we need to support some of these protocols that we're talking about, so conservative, um, uh, conservative peer pseudonym support, and then you've got to support the actual certificate-based approaches, implement those in the OSs. And then the other thing which would be nice is to allow a bit more um, user choice over automatic Wi-Fi network access, which currently is a bit tricky, um, preferably allowing, allowing for editing of uh, all stored associations. So what can you do, user mitigation? Well, with iOS you can, uh, you can go and actually, if you're, if you're near one of these um, automatic Wi-Fi um, networks, you can actually um, tap on the thing, tap on the little I, the little info thing, and then say don't auto join. Um, and then as I mentioned, the conservative peer in iOS. Android, we've got, uh, um, you can forget the, uh, the settings there and uh, for, the, for the auto Wi-Fi again similarly. And you can selectively turn off Wi-Fi calling if you want on the phone as well. And in an untrusted environment, it's probably not a bad idea to turn off Wi-Fi. Summary, so we've got these two, two points where we've uh, found weaknesses. Um, most of the world's smartphones implement these protocols, um, but it does rely, these techniques rely upon the installed operator configuration so that the phones are actually automatically trying to connect to these services. They don't do that necessarily by default, but the major operators do provide that config. So we've been working with these guys, but it is a complicated issue, so it'd take a while. So we've been doing this, um, gonna look into more stuff, we've been doing this under this 5G Ensure European project, um, and we're looking further into these things. So uh, just, I'm just gonna give a quick demo, and um, whoops, let's see if we can slide our way out of here. So, so what we've got here is, whoops, um, I'll turn that off for now. Um, now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the Wi-Fi calling MC catcher. So um, what this is going to do is it's going to set up a um, little access point um, running in a virtual machine on, on the laptop. Um, so I'll, 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 I can run up Wi-Fi and then it'll, it'll um, It'll show a bunch of, so now we're then going to kick, kick off the uh, Wi-Fi calling MC catcher and we'll see in a second um, that the, uh, the phone has to just uh, give, it, give it a full scan. Right, so where are we? There we are, this little guy here, Wi-Fi calling. So um, I'm going to tap on that one. Um, I'm going to join my, um, this one it, sort of just simulating an access point, so we've got to wait for the tick. Um, it obtains an address, um, and uh, then I'll bring up, there we are, so we've got the tick, so we're connected to the, to the, to the network, Ooh. and there, straight off, we see the, um, 
the MC. Now, um, I have uh, sort of ob obfuscated that one, so that's the one from the slides, um, but it's basically a, a script where I'm just dumping it, and um, it's, it's there trying to connect to the Wi-Fi calling server, and I'm um, doing a um, man-in-the-middle attack on, on, the, um, on the phone, basically, and uh, running, running a fake uh, endpoint, and then dumping the, uh, the MC there. So um, then I'm going to do the Wi-Fi uh, network catcher. So now um, you'll see that the Wi-Fi calling, um, whoops, it's trying to connect to the purple. Um, now let's kick this guy off. Now what we've got here is we're, connect we're um, creating a bogus access point, um, which is uh, going to be uh, doing, which is sort of pretending to be a, um, a, a sort of a, a network that is going to steal the creds for the Wi-Fi network authentication. Um, and we're running um, Wireshark here in the terminal to uh, dump the traffic. Now, this guy is... Hmm. And the Wireshark is running on the monitoring mode. Which... Yeah. Currently, this one is not being found. Sorry? Sorry, say again? Oh, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a tricky one now, isn't it? Yeah, I can, I can make it a little bit bigger, but uh, it, um, it appears to be, unfortunately, Not okay. Well, I think it's going fine. This one is unfortunately not working, sadly. Um, I do have a demo of this one, a little video. Um, okay, so oh, there we are. Got it. Right. There we are. So um, we now, so I'm, dump, I'm running a wire shot for those sort of you familiar, so you'll then again be able to see um, it is connecting, well, it's, 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 it doesn't always show you on, on the screen, but what it does is it automatically tries to connect to networks that it knows. So this one I've called as auto e Wi-Fi. So it then, it then tries to connect, but then it fails. But in, in doing so, it, um, it, we're, we're dumping the EAP interchange, and um, you can see this is just yeah, running, as Ravi said, uh, in monitor mode. So it's just capturing the traffic flowing over the network. So there's no decryption being done here. So we see again um, the EMC uh, revealed. And uh, actually, uh, what's the biggest threat here of what he mentioned, or uh, just now we finished in the slide, like you have an iPhone, right? Everybody has an iPhone. So actually in your iPhone, all these profiles, like what he mentioned, auto Wi-Fi calling, are actually locally stored by default by the, by the um, Apple, actually. So you can dump out those database, and he can set up his laptop as an access point. So all your iPhone, which already have this profile, would automatically connect to this Wi-Fi without even asking, as long as your Wi-Fi is on. You don't need to click on connect. And if you just have Wi-Fi on, basically he can just take everybody's MC and can show it here. This is only badly affected with iPhones, actually, and this is the biggest problem for the iPhone. And well, the also, it is, yeah. I, I, I did notice that it also automatically configures on a bunch of um, Android and, and Windows phones. Yeah, so, um, so, so it's basically a thread that you don't uh, notice that this is happening in the background. So you can't yeah. really control on that. So my, as you saw, my phone automatically connected to that EAP SIM um, access point. I had, it, I had set it up previously to the demo, and before I, it was sort of connected to another network, but it, it tries to connect, and, you, and, and we were doing the packet dump, and you could see, you could see it connecting to, to that network. Um, so yeah, so those are basically the two issues. And we, we have been um, working with vendors and, uh, well, mostly operators and OS um, people to, to try and move this forward. But I think it comes a point where you have to sort of spread the word a bit, a bit further to sort of uh, see that um, there is actually um, an issue here and, it, and it, it should be fixed. But it's, it's a complex issue. So it's not like you can't just sort of say, uh, go, go patch that. That little uh, that little bug. Um, it's um, a question of 
getting um, the standards right and getting uh, getting people to implement those and uh, deciding that it's actually worthwhile. I mean, I, I guess at some point, it's this this actual sort of vulnerability, if you like, is written about in the standards. It's a possible. They say it's a possible issue. Um, identity compromise is 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 mentioned in the sort of security considerations, but. Um, I think it's also about how technology has moved on and how um, easy it is to get hold of these things now. Um, I guess these, some of these standards are I'm getting on a bit. Uh, EAP SIM is from 2006, um, and uh, so there's um, well, maybe then they thought it was just that bit more difficult for people to do that sort of thing. I mean, it was. I guess it was definitely the case with mobile spectrum, um, and now you can buy kind of SDR kit um, for a few hundred dollars or, or less um, by the old RTL SDR um, for like 15 bucks to sort of passively sniff on uh, um, some of the mobile spectrum. So it's all become a lot cheaper and more more easy. So then consequently the sort of security solutions need to sort of uh, move up as well. So I don't know if anyone has any more questions um, apart from the font size. <laughs> This is the way you can reveal the IMSI only. There is no way to get the IMEI from the, the phone. No, no, I mean, yeah, you, you can get the IMEI if you do like a, well, a sort of a 2G kind of conventional IMSI so, attack. You can't, you can't get it there. I mean, not, not right now. We haven't, we haven't come up with a way. So this way you get the MAC address of the Wi-Fi? Yeah, I mean, that, that's the thing. I mean, you, you, or you can potentially, um, you can link, you, it's a sort of linking, you can potentially link the MC with the MAC address, which is um, something which is, but the, um, the that's MC, become a problem. Yeah, sorry, it's, uh, the MC is actually, there are other ways to interact, to confirm your phone number. You can't link the MAC address with your phone number, that's the problem. Mm. But MC can link with the phone number and with the guy, public, yeah. public information. Yeah, and you can then like so a SIM card might be moved from one device to another device, so uh, you can then you can then sort of track it through that way. Yeah. <clears throat> There's no no content interception with either of these techniques. Just track. Can you repeat the question because it's on mic? Yeah. Yeah, no content. In, uh, there's no content. Uh, no, you can't obtain content from from this technique. No, just the just the MC. One last question. So one last question here. Yeah. Yeah. Those countermeasures you proposed, in one way or the other, use certificates or certificate-based approaches. Have you ever considered how this might work in roaming? Because, I mean, it's easy if you have one operator, one phone connected, or phone yeah. connected, but in roaming scenarios, you would need a sort of certificate from roughly 800 operators. So. It's potent yeah, I mean, it does start to get complicated. I mean, the thing is, is with Wi-Fi calling, you're actually, you're typically connecting back to the edge packet data gateway run by your own operator. So they'll have the certificate there, you'll have it on your phone, so you won't have necessarily an issue, you'll just be, you'll be, just be traveling over the internet. But with the Wi-Fi network stuff, you may have an issue, but there are some solutions where potentially the authentication would be pushed back. And then you then may want to do, develop some acceleration techniques for localized sort of caching of creds and stuff, but it's, it, it's, it's, I think it's possible, but it does, I mean, it does make it more complicated, yeah. Uh, the um, introduction of certificates and potentially, I mean, more certificates you spread around, the more potential there is for someone to go and steal the certificates and then they can then use one of those stolen certs and then kind of like spoof um, another um, sort of supposedly legit endpoint. But it, I guess it kind of raises the bar, but it, but it does raise the bar in terms of cost as well. So it's, it's a tricky game and also you, it's like what CAs do you rely upon? Like you're probably not gonna wanna rely upon the entire sort of stack of CAs that's in most sort of OSs today. You might wanna have a separate operator store or a possibly in some more protected storage. Um, but then it's updating certs. If they become compromised, there are all those issues then you have with certificate-based security, yeah. Okay, so I think we can take the question offline because he's, he wanted to kick us off now. Anyway, okay. for the next talk, yeah, we can take the offline. Right. Thank you. Thanks very much.